Today I'm going to talk to you about aggregate demand analysis. It's another flip lesson to explain aggregate demand and aggregate supply equilibrium analysis, how the multiplier works in principle, and also how to calculate it. First up, I've got to talk to you about the marginal propensity to consume and the marginal propensity to save. Now what that means, that if I'm going to earn an extra dollar, what proportion am I going to consume, i.e. spend, and what proportion of that am I going to save? Let's do some maths here. So the, level of the amount of income that I get can either be spent on consumption or saved in the banks. Similarly, um, the marginal propensity to consume, let's just say the proportion that I spend of my income, is 80%. Therefore, the remaining, I'm, the remaining 20% I'm going to save, okay, 80 plus 20% is equal to the 1, 100%. But I am also represent this a little bit differently. I can say, okay, the marginal propensity to save is the amount of income that I get as a whole, amount that, the, less the amount that I consume, spend. Using the example of before, if marginal propensity to consume is 0.8, Therefore, the marginal propensity to save is 0.2. I want to first of all talk to you about the multiplier principle using a flow chart. Now, you would already know what aggregate demand is and what components uh, there are of in that. Um, <clears throat> and also, that in equilibrium, aggregate demand is equal to aggregate supply. And that's when there's nothing going to change, no tendency to change. In this instance, I'm assuming that if aggregate demand is bigger than aggregate supply, what will happen? Well, in the first instance, if lots more people are demanding goods and services, stocks of goods and services in shops and retail outlets will fall. We call that the stock adjustment principle. Right? That's, so retailers are saying, look, I need more stock because my stocks are falling. I want to uh, meet the demand of my customers. Eventually what that does, it gives a message to the, produ the production uh, suppliers to increase their level of production, and that's what we call the production response. So they have all these extra orders, well, I've got to increase production. For that, they need extra resources, land resources, capital resources, um, in some instances, but also they need extra labour resources, and that's the important part here. So if I'm going to employ extra labour, if people are getting extra hours, or people are getting new jobs, they're going to get extra incomes, and that's what we call the income response, and importantly, um, once people get an increase in income, they're going to spend it. Okay, I've got a first job, or I've increased my hours, or I'm doing overtime, whatever it is, I'm going to increase my expenditure. And that's what we call the expenditure response. Importantly, uh, we need to know by how much. And that is dependent on the marginal propensity to consume. So if I've got a tendency to spend a lot of my income, the marginal propensity to consume will be high. Um, if I save more, the marginal propensity to consume will be low. Importantly, though, in relation to this um, flow chart, that extra a expenditure will then flow back into this aggregate demand situation again and keep it out of equilibrium, although it will be a little bit less. This is what we call the multiplier. So the initial impact, aggregate demand, if that increases, will then feed into extra expenditure, which keeps feeding and goes round and round and round. But as I'll explain later, that the, the adjustments each time are less and less and less, um, so a new equilibrium will be reached. Um, in time. I'm now going to look at the mathematical uh, way of looking at this, but a reminder, aggregate demand is equal to C plus I plus G plus X minus M. Okay, consumption, investment, government spending, exports, and we take away imports. Now for my purposes today, I'm going to talk about a closed economy, which means we just take out the international sector. I know it's not a realistic assumption, um, but I'm just going to show you the principle how um, the expenditure multiplier uh, works using a mathematical example. I'm also going to assume that I'm starting off at equilibrium, where aggregate demand is equal to aggregate supply. 
Okay, so aggregate demand is made up of those things which equals to aggregate supply. And here I've got some fictitious numbers. In this fictitious economy, a hundred billion dollars is in circulation, represented by 60 consumption, 20 investment and 20 government spending. Okay, just recapping, there, there we are at the previous spot. Now let us assume that government has increased government spending by 5 billion. And I also know that the marginal propensity to consume is 0.8. So it means 80% of any income earned, extra income earned, will be spent on consumption. In this instance, that extra $5 is added on to the government spending. Remember we previously it was 20 now it's 25, which means that we have a disequilibrium where aggregate demand is 105 um, and our aggregate supply is 100. So that means aggregate demand is bigger than aggregate supply. What that will mean through the stock adjustment principle in the production response is that suppliers will adjust production by 5. What does that mean? Well, as you remember before from the flow chart, more production means more labour, it means more income. Remember that income is equal to output is equal to expenditure in any circular flow economy. The question is how much is this extra income, 5 billion, will be spent on consumption? And that depends on the marginal propensity to consume, which, I'll mem which if you remember is 0.8. So it means that 80% of the extra 5 billion of income will be spent. So simply 80% which is 0.8 multiply that by 5 so there, therefore an extra 4 billion dollars will be spent and go into the circular flow. Let's just um, recap from before. So that was the disequilibrium. Right? After one period the um, producers they adjust Right. Remember that that extra adjustment translates into an extra 4 in consumption, right? which means we have a continued disequilibrium. Look, that extra 4 got added on to the 60, giving us 64 in consumption, which has led to an aggregate demand being 109, um, and the, the producers are behind again, this time only by 4. Before it was 5. So they will increase production by 4. With an added four, a production of 4, it means that initially they have adjusted here, but remember that extra 4, 80% um, of that is going to be spent. Working that out, that 0.8 times 4, or 4 eighths, is 3.2. Is so an extra 3.2 will be spent, right? That extra 3.2 gets added on to this figure here, as you can see there. Right? So it means that uh, now we've still got a disequilibrium, but we're getting closer together. Uh, 112 aggregate demand, represented by those figures there, is equal to the adjusted production figure. But you can see how the production sector always lags behind. Remember, consumer sovereignty. We decide what we want to buy. Um, the production sector that supplies, they will respond accordingly. Now, I'm starting to get bored with this. I don't know about you guys, um, but I'm wondering at what stage will the um, new equilibrium occur? Right. <clears throat> Aggregate demand is still bigger than aggregate supply, so adjustments will occur, but they will get smaller and smaller, as you saw. The first one was 5, the next one was 4, the next one was 3.2. It's going to go down and down and down and tend towards a new equilibrium. But um, what will that equilibrium be? So in order to find that, I'm going to um, teach you a shortcut, and this is using the expenditure multiplier formula. And there it is. Expenditure multiplier K. Now, most things in, e in economics have got a symbol or letter. Don't ask me where K came from, but here it is. It's represented by 1 on 1 minus the marginal propensity to consume. Taking an example of 0.8, I 
plug that figure in there, which means that it's 1 on point 0.2. Therefore, if I have a marginal propensity consume of point 0.8, my expenditure multiply K is 5. What does that mean? Let's look at the new equilibrium coming back to the earlier example. So what is my new uh, new level of income based on initial change in aggregate demand of 5 uh, knowing what my expenditure multiplier is? Remember before it was 5, that was the initial change in aggregate demand. The expenditure multiplier is 5. You can see from that the change in income in this economy is 25. So that means an extra 25 will flow into the circular flow from the initial increase of government spending of 5. Remember that government spending is part of aggregate demand, so don't get confused there. So the new equilibrium, we remember initially it was 100 by that action of uh, a government spending of 5 that was multiplied by 5, an extra 25 gets added to the new equilibrium. Right. Remember where I left off before of 112.5, I could have kept on going and going and going until I got to 125. But this is much simpler, as you can see. I'm going to do another example with you just to reinforce what I've been saying. In this instance, let's assume that aggregate demand for all the total function is 200 billion, assuming that the government want to increase government spending by 10 billion. Um, but this time I'm assuming a lower marginal propensity consumed. So remember if that, that much is uh, spent, 25% or 0.25 is saved. So the question is, how much extra income will be generated by an increase in government spending of 10 billion? The previous formula, there it is there. Okay, let's plug, it, plug in some figures. So the change in income, I beg your pardon, that the change in aggregate demand initially was 10, 10 billion times 1 on 1 minus 0.75. Remember that was the marginal propensity consumed that I assumed for this next example. Um, so therefore it's 10 times 1 on 0.25, which is 10 times 4. You can see here that expenditure multiplier is smaller when the marginal propensity consumed is smaller. So in this instance, an extra 40 billion got added onto the economy. So from an increase of 10 billion dollars initially of government spending, an extra 40 billion is generated in the circular flow, right? Which means that the new equilibrium is 240 billion dollars in this economy. Now I'm going to challenge you by taking one step further. Let's assume that we are the government policy makers and they want to increase income, the amount of income in the circular flow, by 50 billion. And normally that will translate into a number of jobs. So if an average income is 50,000, then if you divide that into 50 billion, uh, you'll know that an extra 100,000 jobs will be generated. And that's how they get their figures. You know, we're going to generate so many jobs by doing X. Okay. In this instance, I'm going to assume the marginal propensity to consume is lower at 0.6. So the question they're asking themselves, how much government spending is needed to achieve an actual outcome, increase income of 50 billion? Reminder that uh, the aggregate demand function is that of which government spending is a part. Right? And a change in aggregate demand will obviously be also be represented as a change in government spending. And that was an important distinction to make. All right? Of course, what we're trying to, coming back to our formula, which you have seen twice before now, the change in aggregate demand is actually what we're looking for. All right? We're assuming an income, a change in income of 50. Um, we've got to work out what K is. There, there's a formula for it. So in this instance, um, in order to work out what the change in aggregate demand is, all right? I've got to um, do a bit of algebra here and, my, and divide both sides here by k. So therefore, a, the change in aggregate demand is going to be the change in desired change in income divided by the expenditure multiplier. Okay, let's work out our multiplier first. 1 on 1 minus 0.6, which is going 
going to be a multiplication factor or an expensive multiplier 2.5. Remember again, the marginal propensity consumed was lower, therefore the expenditure multiplier is lower. Right? Therefore, if I then go back to the, initial, the earlier formula, um, of $50 billion is the desired income that we want, well, we, the government, remember, divide that by the expenditure multiplier, that means the government must fork out $20 billion right, of extra government spending in order to achieve an extra income in the circular flow of 50. Alright, so that's what I've just said there. If you want 50, you've got to spend 20 if the marginal propensity consume is 0.6. But what about if the marginal propensity consume is 0.8? How much would the government have to increase government spending in order to achieve the same outcome, i.e., an increase in, in spending or income of 50 billion? Now I'm going to ask you to pause here and try and work that out yourself by um, using the formulas that I've given you. Now if you can't work it out or would like to check your answer, here it is. All right. So remembering from before when I worked out the marginal propensity, cons uh, when the marginal propensity consume is 0.8, that the, the expanded to multiply is 5. So therefore if I use this equation, um, I'm going to end up uh, with a um, answer of 10. So it means that government needs to um, sp spend an extra $10 billion of government spending in order to achieve an, an income, an increase in income of $50 billion. Right? So if, if the people in the economy are spending more, then the amount that the government has to put in the circular flow in the first place as a stimulus is obviously less. So I hope you've got something out of that. Um, I hope you now understand the multiply effect, um, the calculations and the impact on um, government macro uh, fiscal policy. Um, I will be giving you more exercises and other um, tasks to do to reinforce what I've just told you. I'm um, hoping that this has been useful. Thank you for listening and I'll see you in class.